Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Randy Blazak, and uh, the hat that I'm wearing today is as the chair of the Oregon Coalition Against Hate Crimes, which has been around since 1997. We actually started, uh, the first meetings were at Temple Beth Israel in Northwest Portland, uh, chaired by Rabbi Halpern. In 1997, um, the chair was formed in response to the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. When Attorney General Janet Reno recognized there needed to be more communication and networks formed between community groups uh, and government agencies, including law enforcement agencies from the local to the federal level. And we've been doing that work in earnest since 1997, which is 20 something years ago. Um, so welcome to this session about uh, extremism. And we're going to be recording it. We've got the um, Whova app open for questions, which is a new thing for me. So we'll see if that works. We've got the chat uh, and we're, we have built in time for Q and A at the end of this. Um, so I'm really, really honored to be a part of this important forum today, this community call to action. And I think there is much need to talk about these things. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today, and I'm gonna be throwing up some slides in a minute, is sort of the state of affairs when it comes to right-wing extremism especially in the wake of uh, the events of January 6th, which is now a date that will live in infamy, uh, where we are now with regard to that and kind of what the threat is. And then I always like to kind of spend some time talking about what we, what we can do about it, you know, what, what the response from community members should be. So uh, I am going to see if I can share my screen and we will start this discussion. And hopefully, um, people have access to the various technologies that are gonna make this work. But I, I wanna be mindful of time and the fact that we don't have a lot of it. So to go ahead and get started. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Randy Blazak and I'm here as the chair of the Coalition Against Hate Crimes. And the name of this session is the evolving threat of white nationalism. So <laughs> here we go, coffee ready. Into this. Um, so, I, just to give you kind of an overview of our 50 minutes together, what I'd like to talk about is how we got here. A little bit of a historical background, going into a recent history about the this current threat, uh, the the breadth of the script, the threat or the scope of it, and then um, what are some action items that we can take, including with regards to our elected officials, but also within our community. So that's that's our outline," said the professor. We can go back pretty far on this issue, but the real starting point for where we are right now is the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995. Many of you are old enough to remember this. I have students that weren't born then, so this is a little bit of ancient history for them. Uh, but uh, those of us that remember this sort of attack that before 9-11 was the largest terrorist attack in America, kind of caught America off guard because it happened in America's heartland. We'd had attacks in places like New York City, including uh, a bombing attempt on the World Trade Center. And when uh, that happened, the initial response um, from mainstream media and talk radio uh, the, in the minutes that after it happened, it must be a uh, jihadist. Um, I stayed up all night, uh, April 19th, listening to talk radio and taking notes. And they were convinced that it was somebody from the Middle East. Uh, and then they caught the culprit with some pretty quick work, although uh, this individual didn't really try to hide his actions. And it was a US Army veteran named Timothy McVeigh, who had served in the Persian Gulf War. Uh, and uh, all that rhetoric about, um, you know, foreign international jihadist terrorists stopped. And then they just sort of had to say, well, he was just a crazy man. In fact, uh, McVeigh was linked to a white supremacist underground and had been active in that underground. And the uh, bombing of the Murrah Federal Building in 1995 really um, had followed a path that started in Ruby Ridge, Idaho, when the federal government uh, had to try to shut down a white supremacist named Randy Weaver and, and a standoff ensued leading to the, the sad death of his wife from a, um, a federal marksman that was trying to shoot uh, Randy Weaver himself. Two years later, many of you will remember the standoff in Waco, Texas, 
uh, that was another example for, for the right wing underground of the government trying to prevent people from having their First Amendment and their Second Amendment rights. Uh, in fact, one of the people that was there at Waco protesting was a recently returned uh, veteran named Timothy McVeigh, who was at the Waco protest. Uh, one year to the day was the Oklahoma City bombing in which uh, McVeigh and a small group of co-conspirators loaded a um, rider truck full of ammonium nitrate, drove it in front of the federal building in Oklahoma City that housed not only FBI and the IRS, but a daycare facility, lit a fuse and walked away, killing 168 people, including 19 children who were in that daycare facility. And one of the things that emerged from that was sort of an awareness that there was this shadow anti-government underground, that there was a um, militia movement brewing in this country that McVeigh was sort of the product of. And we'd kind of laughed them off in the past as survivalists and people were there, you know, building bunkers in their backyard waiting for the end of times. But when that uh, bombing happened, we realized it was a much more nefarious plot. In fact, groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center had warned Congress about the growing militia threat. And so there became this awareness of this larger anti-government underground and what their end goal was, was a civil war in America. So you think they wasn't just mad at the IRS uh, or any other federal agency. He wanted to inspire like-minded patriots, and they use that term, to attack other federal buildings to start a racial civil war in America. So sort of overnight, or at least over a week or so, there was a new consciousness about the threat of right-wing terrorism in America. It wasn't foreign, wasn't left-wing, it was right-wing terrorism connected to the white supremacist movement. Uh, this group had an extremist playbook that they used. Uh, it's a book called The Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries, in fact, there's, here's my copy right here that uh, I got from Powell's. I won't say I bought it from Powell's, I'll just say I got it from Powell's. Uh, this is uh, a novel written by an Oregonian named William Pierce, who was actually was a physics professor at Oregon State University, believe it or not. It's not written very well. You would be surprised if the person had anything above a high school education. But it is a fantasy novel set in the future uh, about uh, white supremacists starting a race war in America to reclaim their country. And it is filled with uh, anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories, including the, the beliefs that the federal government, including the Republicans and the Democrats are controlled by a um, global Jewish cabal, is incredibly racist, including the notion that black people are cannibals, and uh, sort of lays out the how to have this civil war, how you have start with small bands of patriots attacking federal buildings. In fact, there is a um, scene in it where Earl Turner, who's the hero of the book, uh, has a truck full of ammonium nitrate. He drives it in front of the uh, Oklahoma, uh, in front of the federal building in Washington, D.C. that houses the FBI, lights a fuse and walks away and blows it up. And when you read that passage of this book, you think you were reading a press account of the Oklahoma City bombing because it's exactly what Timothy McVeigh used. In fact, when he was in the military, uh, he gave this book to white comrades uh, and when he was out of the military, he would go to gun shows and hand out copies of this book because he really wanted everybody to read this book. Part of the ideology of this book, and this is where it gets a little um, sort of of the present, is to have white nationalists and white patriots infiltrate the military uh, so they have access to weapons. In fact, the end of the book, not spoiler alert, I don't know if anybody's going to read this, but at the end of the book, once they've had their successful white revolution, is they uh, have access to nuclear weapons and launch nuclear missiles uh, to Tel Aviv and New York City as the centers of uh, Jewish control of the globe to nuke uh, those two cities, killing millions of people. And you know, there is a uh, there is a recurring theme in the Turner Diaries that terrorism is a is a, is a tool to reach an end goal. That you may take out some innocent casualties on, along the way, including children, but if you want to get to this end end goal, which is a, a race war and genocidal violence that they call Rahoa, the racial holy war, then this is the book that you follow. And this is a book that's widely available. Again, I got this at Powell's, um, but you can buy it on the internet. And it is, um, 
it is increasingly uh, read by people who are, are part of the white supremacist movement. So this is what Timmy Steve was using in 95. And, and by the way, thank, if you're just joining us, thanks for hopping in a minute late. I'm, I wanted to get started right on time. Um, we're talking about sort of the roots of where we are now uh, in the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995. Okay, so this gave us kind of an idea about how this, this world was working. It's called the Militia Funnel. It was um, developed by a human rights activist in Montana. Uh, and this is a really useful model. And if uh, you got to see um, the CNN show, United Shades of America, uh, a week or so ago, I was talking about this model on that program. And they had a nice, nice, better animation than I have here. But this is my sort of PowerPoint version of this. And the way this model works, and I think this model is really important in understanding where we are right now. It's a, it's a funnel. It's broad at the top and narrow at the bottom. And at the top level, uh, bringing people into the world of the, of the militia are a lot of mainstream conservative issues. The big one, of course, is guns. You know, they're not going to take my guns away. There's a lot of Second Amendment people from a lot of variety, varieties of backgrounds, including from religious minorities and racial minorities. And there's queer gun advocates. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that are sort of brought in on the gun issue. Another one is taxes. You know, we just passed our tax day and kind of everybody around, uh, you know, tax day, which is sort of a moving target these days, gets a little bit angry at the government. Uh, and so, you know, you have tax protesters that are at the top that don't want their money going to welfare or foreign wars. So there's a lot of people on that level. Land use. Land use is a big one. Uh, land use about um, what land is being taken by the government. So, you know, here in the Northwest, some of you will remember the plight of the spotted owl and a lot of the timber industry was closed down to preserve this endangered species, this little owl. And so there's a lot of land use issues up there. Immigration, I mean, that's always sort of a conservative issue about who's being led into this country and what's their impact on the government. So on the top level, a lot of people are brought into the militia world and these kind of garden variety, mainstream conservative issues. But you go, you start going down the funnel and because it's a funnel, you lose some people, but it becomes kind of an anti-government movement. The government is the bad guy. The federal government, the Republicans and the Democrats that are all the same. The, the federal government is sort of inherently corrupt and, uh, you know, they're involved in all kinds of ways to deprive you of your money and your guns. And so we're targeting the government. You go down a little bit farther in that funnel and it is a, it, it's conspiracy theories. The, the Republicans and Democrats are controlled by some outside influence. And in the old days, we used to talk a lot about, um, you know, the Illuminati or the Freemasons. I mean, those Freemason conspiracy theories are sort of wonderful to dive into. If you've ever seen any of those old Nicolas Cage movies, there's always some shadow government. And then you go down a little bit farther in the funnel and that conspiracy theory becomes a familiar one. Uh, what, what they would call the Zionist occupation government, a global Jewish conspiracy that the federal government including both political parties and the media and everyone else is controlled by a global Jewish cabal. They'll cite the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which is a completely forged uh, piece of literature that claims the Jews run the world. And so as you go down this funnel, you lose people, but it becomes sort of more intense. And then when you get to the bottom of the funnel, what you get are the revolutionaries. This is the Timothy McVeigh's of the world, the, the people that believe you can talk all this stuff and have all this analysis and see the world in a certain way, but you need to do something about it if you want to save your country. You need to spill the blood of patriots. You need to rise up uh, in a violent revolution and save America. And so the, the way this funnel works is the more people that come at the top, the more people you will end up with at the bottom. And this was the concern in the 1990s when we were looking at the rise of the militia movement that led to the Oklahoma City bombing is that a lot of people were coming in on gun rights issues and tax issues. And once they were in this world, they started to kind of seek a sink farther down into these conspiracy theories. And they were starting to, to populate the bottom of that funnel, which were the violent revolutionaries. And this is why the federal government after Oklahoma City um, not before, like the Southern Poverty Law Center had, you know, warned, but after kind of had their hair on fire about the threat of domestic terrorism. So I think this funnel is really, uh, really useful. And we're going to come back to it in a little bit. 
So what happened to all that militia activity? Well, there was a lot of buildup, um, uh, especially towards something that some of you folks might remember, Y2K. Does anybody remember Y2K? Boy, that was a whole lot of craziness about nothing. But there was a belief that uh, when the computers turned over from 1999 to 2000, it would create a glitch since we were just using the last two numbers and they would read 00, zero as 1900 instead of 2000, which would cause a, a massive computer shutdown and airplanes would fall out of the sky and prison gates would open and nothing would work and you wouldn't be, have access to your money. So a lot of these uh, militia groups uh, were really focused on that chaos as the launching point for their revolution it was sort of this hyper uh, fixation on Y2K as an opportunity. The reason that that didn't happen, first of all, Y2K didn't happen. Our computers figured it out and some nerds somewhere figured out how to make sure that there wasn't this massive glitch and Y2K was a whole bunch of nothing. Uh, but the, also the FBI under Attorney General Janet Reno really put uh, these militia groups and patriot groups and domestic ex extremism in general on the, on the front burner really made it a high priority. And there were numerous investigations doing this. I was doing this work in the late 1990s. And there were lots of things that sort of made a little bit of news, but they didn't make a lot of news because they didn't happen, including plots to blow up dams, plots to blow up power stations, plots to attack synagogues. Uh, there were a lot of plots that were busted up by the FBI because they really marshaled the resources. Um, but also part of this, which I think is an important piece, is there was kind of a community backlash against the militia movement. This was largely rural, uh, you know, from rural Michigan to rural Montana. But the images of the Oklahoma City bombing uh, with those 19 children that were killed, I mean, I think everyone will remember. I didn't, I didn't post the picture here because it's just traumatizing of the firefighter with the body of the five-year-old child who was already dead, uh, really disgusted a lot of people who might be sympathetic to this cause when they when they saw that these folks were willing to kill small children and community members started turning people in they started calling their local police department and saying hey somebody's building bombs in the backyard or they called the fbi tip and tip line and said you know i think um you know, some people in my um you know in my church are involved in some anti-government activity and so there was a lot of community buy-in to the pushback against the militia movement uh also in 2000 even though it was quite contested uh george w bush was elected and a lot of folks um felt well this guy has our interest you know he's going to shut down any type of gun control he's going to roll back environmental regulations he's going to uh you know cut taxes and so we've got a friend in the white house and so we don't have to have our revolution because maybe it'll happen uh, internally and of course then 9 11 happened uh and 9 11 happened shortly after mcveigh uh was executed and um, that changed the focus of the country back to international terrorism. And we kind of took our eye off the, um, off the domestic terrorism, but it, it had been largely squashed by a combination of more focus from federal authorities uh, and, and a lot of um, state and, and local law enforcement and sort of a community revulsion to the, um, the death toll from Oklahoma City. So, kind of went off the radar for a little bit. But then we start moving into the next wave when it starts creeping back up again. And this happens, you know, around the time of the, um, the Obama election. Uh, this to many of these folks, who, again, were rooted in a, a white supremacist ideology was proof, proof of everything they had uh, believed was gonna happen to America, that there was a, a quote unquote black Muslim foreign <laughs> There was a guy that was like spreading a theory that um, that Obama was born in Kenya. I don't know whatever happened to that guy. He's like a game show host or something. Uh, we saw the rise of the Tea Party movement, which was again at the top level of this funnel, focused largely on tax issues, but used a lot of racist imagery. If you remember some of the racist anti-Obama uh, signs um, that. For example, in this image, uh, we saw an explosion of hate groups. The Klan was back in force when Obama was elected. They had their boogeyman. Uh, and we saw a rise in hate groups as charted by groups like the 
SPLC and the ADL. Uh, but we also saw, you know, the, the dawn of social media and the, the kind of new world of internet trolls. People, instead of marching in front of a school or organizing a Klan rally or, uh, you know, training people for an underground army, were uh, harassing people online, just harassing people, you know, going to people's MySpace pages, if you remember that, or Facebook pages, and, and going to their blogs and just sort of harassing them with a lot of anti-Semitic, sexist, homophobic rhetoric and hiding behind the wall of anonymity in the internet. We also saw, and this is a big part of this, is the growth of right-wing media. You know, back, I, I could talk to us folks from the 20th century who remember a name Walter Cronkite, when everybody got their news, you know, at the same time on Sunday night um, uh, at CBS and Walter Cronkite would sort of tell us, here's what you need to know. And that's the way it is. And that was, you know, that was the, um, the common knowledge that everybody had. With the internet, all of a sudden we developed these media silos and everybody goes into their separate corners that are either, you know, going to Fox News or MSNBC. And then on the internet, there's an explosion of right-wing media in places like Newsmax and OANN and all that. And so people don't have to go to Walter Cronkite anymore. They're going to find news that fits their narrative. And so that's spreading a lot of the misinformation. And of course, Social media adds to this. We, we use social media to spread all this information, all the anger, uh, and there's sort of this explosion of misinformation that happens with this sort of weird, perfect storm of a black president, a rise in the sort of top level of the militia movement, and then the internet just sort of pushing everybody into our, um, our, our separate corner. So when I was doing this work during the Obama years, the vast majority of it was focusing on online hate. I mean, that was really where we were seeing all the harassment and all the organization and not really in the streets as it had been in the 20th century. It was all kind of an online phenomenon. And certainly within academia, that was our, um, our focus. And then something happens. Ready? Something happens. Da, da, da. <laughs> this guy comes down the golden escalator uh, in um, 2015 uh, to a crowd of adoring people that he actually had paid to be there and started his candidacy off by talking about Mexicans being murderers and rapists and uh, bringing some of those populist themes of jingoism and xenophobia right to the front. And those of us that remember this, I mean, who doesn't remember this thought, well, this will never work. Americans will never buy into this. And in fact, um, it did. So when we look at this moment in history, sort of the post Obama moment, uh, we see an, a, you know, an incredible um, rise in xenophobia, uh, including not just against Latin Americans, but against Chinese, you know, the, the trope that he pushed that um, global warming was a Chinese hoax. There was a lot of scapegoating. Your problems are because of these people. And this is just, you know, this is just history writ all over. Uh, and but he was very active uh, in targeting a, a specific audience, and that, that was the downwardly mobile. The downwardly mobile, who are the the victims, if we can use that word, of globalization. You know, uh, 60 years ago, most Americans worked at General Motors, and all of a sudden, most Americans are working at a Walmart, and the American dream is out the window. He did a really good job of speaking to that world about how things had changed. Uh, there's this hyper toxic masculinity. You know, using violence, puffing up your chest. We're going to smash them. We're going to beat them. Drag those people out. So you know that brought a lot of, especially male. Uh, minds to the to the front. Uh, there was a lot of language about draining the swamp, uh, that, that the Republicans and the Democrats are both a product of some horrible system. As an outsider, he's going to come in very anti-intellectual, right? Facts, we don't need no stinking facts. I mean, that was all um, sort of seen as something that was a, a, a liberal uh, privilege to talk about facts. But also a really important part of this was this past focus. And this is a, this is a really important theme when we talk about right-wing extremism. This sort of make America great again, right? In 2015, a CNN reporter asked candidate Trump, when is the again in again? And because um, you know, it has to be that America was great, but now it's not. 
So he's going to make America great again. So when was it great? And I, I think they were hoping that he didn't say like 1850, but he did say 1950. He said late 40s, early 1950s, which in my mind, uh, there's sort of two ways of reading that. One, he's talking about the economy, which probably is what he, you know, he probably would say he was. And of course, that economy had the highest union membership in the country's history and the highest taxation rate of the rich. <laughs> so there's a lot of like Bernie Sanders folks out there who would say, yeah, let's go back to 1950 and we start taxing the wealthy again and getting people back uh, into union secure jobs. But there's also a lot of people that heard 1950 as, well, that's the peak of Jim Crow. That's before the modern feminist movement when women are, you know, women at home, white suburban women were all in Valium. Uh, not all of them, just most of them. Uh, that was before the disability rights movement. That was before Stonewall and the gay rights movement. That was before a whole lot of civil rights happened when, the, when straight white men, cisgender authority was unchallenged. And so, yeah, let's go back to Jim Crow. Let's make America that again. Let's make America, you know, white again. And so that served as a kind of calling card for the people that had been bubbling under in the underground right-wing movement during the Obama years to start coming forward and start moving from behind their computers to into the streets. So we saw uh, uh, an explosion of right-wing extremism starting in 2015 and it became broadly labeled as the alt-right, you know, the, a belief that the conservative movement that we know as the GOP wasn't conservative enough we wanted to move farther uh, down the right wing spectrum, which of course, if you know that political spectrum, it goes straight to Hitler. So we had the rise of people like Richard Spencer, who was saying, you know, hail, tr hail Trump uh, at Trump's election. We had the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in which they were chanting, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us with their tiki torches that led to the death of an anti-racist activist named Heather Heyer, who was killed by a car, which is sort of the weapon of choice of uh, hate mongers these days. We saw kind of new hate groups on the scene, most famously the Proud Boys, who frame themselves as, uh, they're not white supremacists because they have a couple of people of color. They are uh, Western chauvinists. Which I was not quite sure when I heard that. There was a, a Proud Boy rally in Portland in 2017. They were interviewing one guy and he said, uh, I'm a Western supremacist. And I thought, well, West Coast is the best coast. Count me in. I'm a Proud Boy too. But what he was talking about was Western civilization. And Western civilization is code for European civilization, which is code for white people. And um, white people created everything. So it, it, you know, the Proud Boys are really uh, wrapped up in kind of an anti-immigrant rhetoric, especially an anti-Muslim rhetoric. Uh, anti-feminist, uh, they're very, um, very sexist. Uh, you know, they're a fighting club. One of their um, mottos is venerate the housewife, like it was 1950 again. And there are other groups too, like the base and Adam, Woff, uh, Adam Woffen, Adam Woffen uh, that uh, have international ties. And then we also saw sort of a new version of the militias emerge as well, kind of given a, a, a revitalization uh, by this new ascendancy of this populist hero and groups like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. Uh, and that language that McVeigh had in the Turner Diaries about racial revolution was reframed in kind of a, an internet jokey way as the Boogaloo, named after an 80s hip hop movie. Uh, and so they, they now refer to this as the Boogaloo. But the Boogaloo is sort of the code word for the revolution. And they will hide it in clever internet slang. And sometimes it's the big luau and they'll wear Hawaiian shirts. But it, essentially, it's the same rhetoric. And like the, uh, like the previous generation of militias, it's very apocalyptic. Everything is about to crash. Society is about to end. The browning of America or, you know, the, the sort of feminization of the soy boys of America, you know, the, the, all the stuff is about to destroy the, the kind of America that they created, like they were here in 1776. And so there's, there's this ticking time clock of we have to act now or else we're gonna lose this country. So it sort of pushes people forward. And then, at, you know, then something adds to this. So all this is, as we know, is ramping up in the Trump years. We're seeing an increase in hate crimes, increase in anti-government activity, increase in recruitment into domestic uh, violence organizations like militia groups. I and mean, we were just seeing it happen right before our eyes 
uh, in the streets. You know, we're seeing white supremacists marching through the streets of Portland like it was just any other Sunday. And so that's all building up. And then of course, COVID hits. And COVID, um, while it suppressed some things, the crime rate went down. <laughs> The flu rate went down because everybody was wearing a mask. Uh, we saw these groups seize onto this and they seized onto it sort of for two reasons. One is it added to the xenophobia that this is a foreign plot, uh, that this is brought here by a, you know another country and it's the immigrants that are bringing it in. Just like if you know anything about the 1919 flu pandemic, which we wrongly labeled the Spanish flu, it was actually from Kansas. Um, that was used to target immigrants 100 years ago. And so you know, we saw an increase in hate crimes against Asian and Asian Americans that we just you know, got a new federal law uh, inspired by. And so there was a lot of that, but also the, the lockdowns that we needed for public health to try to suppress the spread of the illness and getting social distancing and closing schools and wearing masks and closing businesses down was seen as another overstep of the government. So the militia groups came out in force against the lockdowns. Uh, and all of a sudden, where they had just sort of been kind of marching and showing up at places like Charlottesville, now they were on, in, on the steps of state capitals all across the country, including here in Oregon. Um, and added to this, of course, were um, some of these conspiracy theories. So it just it just brought the, the already growing problem to a, a, an extreme level in 2020. So we go back to the funnel, we revisit the funnel and we see sort of, you know, we kind of update this funnel from the models and we see the same mainstream conservative issues, including taxes and guns, but also added to that, the anti-lockdown. I'm not gonna wear a mask. The government's gonna tell me what to do. It's my body, my choice. Like they appropriated that from the pro-choice movement that, uh, you know, these governments are, are taking away my rights. And so that brings a lot of people into the top of the funnel. You know, your government is shut down. You're probably going to be angry, right? If your your kid can't go to school, you're probably going to be angry. So it brings more people in, and then the anti-government part becomes the swamp. The swamp was the you know the language that Trump used about the government itself is all corrupt. Republicans, Democrats. I mean, I don't know how many times we've heard the word rhino in the last year. You know, to attack Republicans that won't go along with this kind of. Trumpism, uh, populist viewpoint. And then you go down to the next level and we get to the conspiracy theories and the conspiracy theories because of the internet have exploded. So that includes QAnon and these theories of the deep state uh, added to these conspiracy theories or the belief that the, uh, the um, disease itself of COVID is a plot. Uh, it's made to destroy the American economy, uh, sent here by China to completely wipe out the American economy. And you go down farther and you end up at the same place you end up on the other funnel, that this is a Jewish plot, that it is a Jewish plot to destroy the government. And Anthony Fauci is an agent of the Zionist occupation government sent from the, you know, this council of elder rabbis to destroy America by sending this lie out that uh, COVID is real and uh, you know, all these measures have to be taken. And also added to that now is that the vaccine is part of you know, the government control. I was in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago talking to a third grade teacher and we had been vaccinated and we were talking about getting the vaccine and she said, oh, I'm not gonna get that vaccine because I read on a credible website that you get the vaccine and a year later you're dead. I was like, I don't think that's true. Uh, so the funnel, you know, we're just updating the funnel, but it brings a lot more people in at the top because of the addition, not only of the, you know, the president sort of saying all these things are true, but the lockdowns around COVID really shove a lot of people into the funnel. Uh, and then, and, and, and social media explodes that because now you don't have to have someone who has a copy of the Turner Diaries to hand you. You just log onto your Facebook and it's all right there. And at the bottom, we end up at the same place, which is revolution. So the danger of this model versus the 1990s version of it is that there's a lot more people coming in at the top and therefore there's a lot more people going down, down, down through the layers of this 
uh, buying into these crazy Q theories. I mean, Q, uh, Q and non is now popular in a lot of evan evangelical circles. I mean, it's a, it's a complete fabrication. It's been debunked a million times. They have all these prophecies that never come true. And it's still widely popular because it helps people to understand the world that they're in, at least as they see it, as it pops up on their Facebook page. So what happens? I mean, what happens when we have you know, this online phenomena and a population that is fragile economically uh, as the economy changes, socially as the demographic makeup of the country changes, and then we have someone who is just feeding from the very top, from a very credible position, the President of the United States of America. Uh, that was awesome. These conspiracy theories. Well, of course, that brings us to January 6th. I mean, that this is the, you know, I hate to say I told you so, but we are talking about this coming a lot in 2020. Those of us that do this work and watch these groups, that these groups were gearing up for their Rohoa, for their Boogaloo. So we're not done with it yet. I mean, a lot of folks hope that after Inauguration Day and we had a successful transfer of power finally, that a lot of this would go away. Uh, those of us that watch this wish that was true, but it's kind of the opposite in a sort of frightening way. We are seeing an explosion of anti-Semitism, uh, including these groups utilizing the conflict in Gaza to further their point. They've just really latched onto the Gaza conflict to talk about their theories about a global conspiracy theory. Uh, we have the, the explosion of conspiracy theories, um, especially because of the stop the steal rhetoric, the belief, you know, there, there's a majority of Trump voters who believe that Trump is the legitimate president at this very moment. He's just waiting at Mar-a-Lago for the audit in Arizona and Georgia, and then he's going to, you know, kick Biden out of the White House. I mean, there's just this incredible amount of people willing to buy into these conspiracy theories. As someone who's been studying conspiracy theories for over 30 years now, it's just, it's, it's just awe-inspiring and a little depressing to think that so many people, including people in our own families, right, are convinced about conspiracy theories on COVID or stop the steal or whatever it is. Uh, we're also uh, really looking at how these groups have taken the Turner Diaries to heart and are focusing on military and police intervention to get people inside law enforcement. The Oath Keepers, I don't know if you saw the, the leader of the Oath Keepers on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago, but they brag about how many people they have inside the military, how many Timothy McVeigh's they've got inside with access to weapons. Uh, and that's also frightening and in law enforcement. Uh, and they're really looking forward to this summer, which should be in this area, a long hot summer. We'll, I'm sure we'll have more forest fires and more kind of disruption and more protests uh, and utilizing that. Uh, they love the chaos and, and the rhetoric from these folks when you follow them on their, on their chats is they're in it for the long game. Yeah, they might not have stopped inauguration day. Doesn't matter, there's another Marjorie Taylor Greene out there uh, who will take up the, the mantle, who will take it to the next level, that Trump opened the door and now there's a bunch of little sort of versions of that personality that are gonna march through uh, and, and send us into this next civil war. Just recently at the Oklahoma City uh, anniversary, Merrill Garland highlighted the fact that we've got a real threat to deal with. Uh, and the, I guess the good news is that we have an administration that recognizes this threat. So what do we do? What do we do? And I want to make sure we kind of get through this so we have some time to discuss uh, next steps. Well, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. <laughs> One of the big things is to bring back the focus of f from federal law enforcement but state and local law enforcement as well to really focus on these threats. We've seen a lot of this, including uh, the, the base was recently shut down by the FBI, although it's popping back up. But one of the other things that really helped in the 1990s was the buy-in from the community. And we kind of learned this in certainly places like Europe and Israel and, and other places that have experienced a lot of terrorism know this. If you see something, say something. If you see a suspicious car, parked in front of a government building, if you see uh, a bag that nobody is sitting next to on a mass transit, you have to kind of report these things, but also be willing, respecting people's First Amendment rights. Uh, if, there are, if there are plots, 
being hatched, you know, in your neighborhood, um, you should also be willing to report that. In Oregon, we have a, a really great new tool, which is in 2019, in the fall of 2019, we have a, a new bias crime law that was signed by the governor, uh, SB 577. It's a really kind of useful law that looks at not only bias crimes, but bias incidents. And part of what came out of that law is a, is a hotline. We have a, a state hotline that's run by the Oregon Department of Justice, and that's the phone number there, 1-844-924-BIAS, or you can just Google Oregon bias crime law and it will pop up. And um, so we're, to make sure this information is flowing in and we can prevent these these looming plots that are, are that are happening, and you know, one of the one of the things that has sort of awakened Portland to this threat was what happened on our, our Max train in 2017. And I, I know everyone who was here remembers that we had an individual named Jeremy Christian, who had been harassing people of color uh, on public transit, and then on one spring day uh, in May. Um, uh, sort of assaulted these two uh, young African-American girls, one wearing a hijab and three men stood up to ask him to stop and he stabbed all three of them, killing uh, two of them. I mean, just a horrific day. And if you go to the Hollywood Max station, you can see the memorial that's sort of been painted there to remember that horrible day. What a lot of people don't know is that um, Jeremy Christian was uh, a fan of Timothy McVeigh. On his, uh, on his Facebook page, he had a picture of the Oklahoma City bombing uh, and a tribute poem to Timothy McVeigh. And the picture was after the bombing. Uh, and he said, we need more McVeighs. And people might remember when he was arraigned in Multnomah County Court, he said, you might call me a terrorist. I call myself a patriot. That's right out of the Timothy McVeigh Turner Diaries playbook. Uh, it, took us, it took us a good year to convince Facebook to take down that that um, page from Jeremy Christian because it was becoming a hangout for other anti-government activists uh, and who wanted to wanted to follow in McVeigh's footsteps. So we really have to be vigilant when we see these activities happening. Uh, and that includes having really good open communications with law enforcement, including at the FBI. And that's kind of the work that we do through the coalition. But you know, we encourage people to do that anyway, especially when they see behavior. We also have to track online pathways to hate. Um, so if you know the name Dylan Roof, who was the shooter at the Charleston uh, AME church where he killed eight African-American uh, parishioners, um, Dylan Roof was an avowed white supremacist and anti-government uh, activist or anti-government you know, zealot. Uh, he never attended a single hate group meeting. He was radicalized online. And so we know the online piece of this is really important and finding out how people go from, you know, maybe losing their job or losing their girlfriend to going online and then finding something that sort of fits their anger and their way of looking at the world and then develop an action plan to go out and commit violence. We've got sort of case after case to show up this pathway. And so we have to better track how that happens, including uh, keeping organizations uh, that are private like Facebook uh, and Google, uh, keeping their feet to the fire to do um, a sort of cleansing of hate material. There's a really great organization out of London that just moved to DC called Moonshot CVE and it charts uh, internet tracking, uh, internet searches around hate. And one of the things that found in the report, and you can look them up, just sort of Google Moonshot CVE. They had a report that came out after the January 6th uprising, <clears throat> looking at uh, internet traffic about people who wanting to commit acts of terrorism or join right-wing groups, join the Proud Boys, how to build a bomb, how to kill a senator. And the state that was number one in these internet searches, Oregon. Oregon was the number one state for anti-government internet searches based on the moonshot uh, study that was done. So keeping track uh, of this is a really important piece of this. Now, um, we have to demand policies about infiltration. You know, there, there are policies that say, if you're a member of the, you know, the United States military, you can't belong to another uh, extremist organization, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So uh, from the local police, I just had a meeting yesterday with the, um, our new uh, police chief in Salem saying, hey, this is one of the things that we're really worried about is that not only 
does the community think the, the police in Salem are giving the Proud Boys a pass, but also that there are people within the police department that might be sympathetic to their cause. So we really have to have policies that say, not consistent with our values. If you think the cops are Nazis, you know, you're not gonna get a lot of buy-in from the community. So we really have to work on those policies around infiltration. Uh, the next step is about the funnel model. How do we stop people coming in at the top? Because again, the more people that come in at the top of the funnel, the more people that end up at the bottom with the revolutionaries. And that means interrupting conspiracy theories, helping people manage these issues without diving into the world of, of um, anti-government patriot militia movements. And part of that is having constructive conversations. Probably everybody here has had a family member or a friend or a friend of a friend that has gone into this funnel. I certainly have, I've got a family member, I won't mention my father's name, who believes that the election was stolen and you know that the January 6th insurrection were a bunch of Antifa activists Trump, dressed as Trump supporters. Like you have to have those conversations or else those people start going down the funnel. So um, part of this is about civility. How do we talk to people who have radically different views than us uh, to help find some common ground, excuse me, common ground, or at least bring them away from the, the mouth of the funnel, funnel. Also, you know, this is a, a role of leadership, being able to talk about what this country's future is gonna look like. America is a nation of immigrants and we are becoming browner by the day. Uh, the Census Bureau predicts that by the year 2050 and probably before that, the piece of the American pie that's white will be down to about 49%. So, um, you know, we'll have a, a, a much greater proportion of uh, people of color in this country. And you can either accept it and celebrate it and think that it adds to our American patchwork that makes us more diverse. So we're a lot less wasp, right? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. That wasp piece of the pie is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Um, you, can, you can embrace that and see it as a powerful thing, or as these people do, you can be terrified by it and try to push back against it through acts of terrorism. So there's a real role of leadership about the value, the value of diversity. I mean, it sounds like a bumper sticker, but actually it makes us, it makes life better. <laughs> as someone who's married to a brown person, I can say makes life much better. Um, so to have those conversations, so a lot of white people and cisgendered people and straight people and male people aren't panicked about all the changes that are happening, that their, their country is going away. It's all of our country and it's better because, uh, because of this path that we're on of diversity and inclusion. And then the last on the list is to be mindful of international connections. And this is not an American phenomenon. We're seeing incredible spikes of right-wing terrorism in in England, in Australia, in Germany, of all places, where they've had uh, they they had elected leaders killed who were sort of pro-immigrant, killed by neo-Nazis. Uh, we are seeing this ha happening all over. Russia is a complete um, culprit in its facilitation of the destabilization of kind of our conversation about race, but also backing some of the more extreme elements. Uh, in fact, uh, during the Obama years, where a lot of those white supremacists, people like David Duke went, was to Russia because they could make mo money there. Um, so that's also something to be mindful of. And so I want to leave some time at the end here, but this, I think this image is really important. This is a Proud Boy rally in front of Salem, our, our Capitol building. Uh, and the fellow in the middle there who's not wearing a mask is uh, a guy named uh, Kyle Brewster. Kyle Brewster is one of the three skinheads that murdered Mulligata Sarah in 1988 in Southeast Portland. He's now out of prison and an active member of the Proud Boys. So if that doesn't bring this full circle, I don't know what does. Okay, Lord, I've uh, really filled up all that time. So let me uh, pop out of here and see if there are any quick questions. Um, I'm looking at some of the things that are popping up in the chat. So I want to have some time to... Um, Oh, you, it looks like you guys are sharing some really good information in the chat, which is really helpful. And I've also got the, um, I got a question. Oh, I got some questions coming in Hulu. Let me see if I can do this. Um, it seems to me today the white nationalist movement has truly exploded and become mainstream. Can we put the genie back in the bottle? Well, the good news here is um, that for a, a lot of young people, um, they are so inclusive 
uh, that they see this as sort of an older phenomenon. When I go out and talk to young people about it who have, you know, who are more queer and are more, uh, have more friends from different backgrounds and have friends of different religions, they see it as sort of an older phenomenon and their hope as sort of the younger generation Z uh, folks is that this will sort of fade away as those people get older and older. The problem is, you know, and, and this isn't meant to be, um, you know, lighthearted, but it just takes one Timothy McVeigh to ruin your whole day. You know, a small group of these people, as we saw in January 6th, can create a, a lot of damage. But with education, yeah, it's, it's a hard issue to, to say, put, you can put it back on the bottle. Um, uh, so oh, about the hotline, so the each state should have a Department of Justice uh, hotline uh, or a Department of Justice contact information. Typically, it's not a hotline. It is, uh, it's a website. So each state, if you go to the Department of Justice, it should have a civil rights reporting portal uh, that you can report through. You just have to sort of look at your um, state Department of Justice. Um, how successful have I been with changing my father's views? I'm working on it. We're talking again. He he unfriended me from Facebook. Said you can either be my son or you can support Antifa, and then unfriended me. So we're talking again, and we're working on it. It's a it's a process. Thanks for that, Todd. I think a lot of people have folks. I mean, it's like the Civil War, you know, brother against brother. I think a lot of people have these rifts inside their families that they really um, need to spend some time figuring out how to mend. Um, yeah, there's some really great comments here about uh, just, you know, the challenges that we have. Um, and there, there, there's a lot. So there's a lot of resources. And, and part of what today is about is sort of learning about those resources and, and, and making connections. And so I hope this was useful. Uh, I'm out of time because I know everybody has to have, have a little break before the next session. So uh, I, um, at the end, um, included my website, randyblazak.com, if you have more questions. Uh, and I'm on Blazak at uh, on Twitter at rblazak, but randyblazak.com is the best way to get in touch with me. If you have more questions or you want uh, uh, some of the resources that I alluded to, I'm happy to share them with you. Um, great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. This was a lot in a short period of time. Uh, I appreciate your uh, participation, and I hope you're going to have a great day. We've got great Eric Ward uh, later today is an amazing speaker. He and I go back to the streets of Portland in the 1990s. Uh, please. Um, Please drop in on his uh, talk today. It's going to be great. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> it went by very quickly. Um, I wish we had had more time. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope this was useful. Uh, and we'll see you on the funny pages, as they say. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Salem, we've got a great new uh, Salem police chief. Um, looking forward to some really good things happening there in the future.